Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome to Mind Heist episode 56. Is it? Oh, yeah, it is. I, I mean, that was a guess, but I think it oh. is. 56 or 57. How's it going, bro? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Not bad. Alhamdulillah. How are you? I'm good, man. Um, I have a. I think we're gonna we're gonna answer some questions in this episode. But first, I have my own question for you. Okay. So I was talking uh, about this with my wife, and I was thinking um, it's a good question, actually. You know, a few episodes back, I was reading from the Quran, yeah, and I was saying I was skipping through the ayah to get to the point I was trying to get to, and I was like, etc., etc., etc. Or I said, blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah, remember, and and my wife's like, yeah, that wasn't good, yeah, and I was like, yeah, that's true, it wasn't good, yeah, but then I got to this whole question of should something like that, yeah, it, I agree, it's not good, and even the way I said I probably shouldn't be saying that, it sounded very like nonchalant, even though I I did in the moment I was like, yeah, that's not good, and I admit it's not good, um, but the question is. Do you think something like that should be edited out, right? So any negative thing that we do and we know it's bad, we we uh, you know we admit that it's a wrong thing, should we edit that stuff out, or does keeping some of these smaller things in there allow an understanding that we're human and you know we're making mistakes and we're not some kind of crazy, you know, uh, perfect people kind of thing, you know? Mm. What do you think? I think uh, it depends what the the mistake is. I think mm. something like that, we mm. have now not just learned from it, but we've mm. rectified it, and then we've sort of spread that message to the listeners as well. Because I'm sure they then they will learn. Oh, yeah, I should be more careful when I talk about the Quran or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. um, naturally, after doing 56 episodes, I'm sure they're full of mistakes. Uh, yeah. It's different to. I think the only thing I would ever edit out is if, like, it was something that, I don't know, you promoted something maybe that was actually really bad. And mm. actually the the harm of doing so, mm. it's, it, it outweighs the good. Like, I, yeah. it's, a, it's all about that maslaha nafsida thing. So yeah. if the harm of what you've done or said, or let's say you, but any of us <laughs> have done or said, outweighs the good that can come out of it then I think that's when we're like... And I don't think we've ever... I don't think I've ever edited anything out of the podcast. I don't know about you. I yeah. just feel like it's it's just too much effort <laughs> uh, <laughs> to go in and start fiddling about with it. Especially for us, because we record separately anyway, and we have to yeah. sort of put them in together. It mm -hmm. is a big, big task. I do know some people that do edit stuff in their podcasts. Um, mm -hmm. And they'll even say on their podcast, oh, shall we edit that out? Blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um I don't think we've ever fallen into that. Maybe because we're just a bit more sensible. But it's part of the learning experience. And I think for many mm. people, like if we do a mistake, we've had sometimes where we've said something and the next episode we're like, oh yeah, we need to rectify that, et cetera. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and we do open up the floor to people to, to say, hey, if we've made a mistake or if there's something you disagree with, then drop us a message. Yeah. Um, and that's how, that's how it keeps the community going. I think, yeah, like that that particular mistake, I think, it's beneficial to sort of, we've addressed it and we've sort of um, identified, mm -hmm. you yourself, you've identified, um, you know, how it, it doesn't reflect badly on you in a sense. It doesn't make you, it's not like you're promoting that sort of behavior. You're identifying mm -hmm. that it was something that, in all honesty, mm -hmm. is most likely just a habitual thing that comes out of talking about anything as opposed yeah. to specifically the Quran, isn't it? Like if you were reading for any book and you wanted to fast forward to a particular part that you were looking for, that's the sort of thing we do. Mm. Anyway, ultimately, after all of my waffling, <laughs> I think it's fine. Mm. Okay. One thing I was thinking is related to, I think it was episode 54, where we're talking about you know, people making mistakes and people correcting them in public and stuff like that. And we're talking about t too many people follow personalities rather than, you know, the correct things that they're saying, yeah. you know, and people just follow people, you know, whether the person makes a mistake or they're right most of the time, people are actually following the person and not what they're saying. Yeah. And so we, we end up with this situation where people 
subconsciously consider all these public figures to be kind of perfect. And I thought, if you make mistakes in public, you know, small ones, and you correct yourself in public, maybe that would be a healthy, you know, create a healthier relationship with public figures, you know? Hmm. So that's what I was thinking. Like, maybe it would be a good thing in that sense um, to break down that whole, oh, he's famous or he's a sheikh, so he must be perfect kind of thing. Mm, definitely. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's let's go with the questions. Should we start with the email questions? Or... Let's, let's bounce. You, you do one. Don't You can start yeah. an email one and then we'll I'll do yeah. the other stuff. Okay, so um, we got an email, uh, episode 54, comments. So I think it's a comment, maybe, rather than email, uh, rather than a question. Salam alaikum, Amin and Muhammad. I hope all's well. I've been enjoying your podcasts. I have no questions, but just some comments about episode 54. Um, episode 50 was really good and, needed, and, and was needed in this area of social media. The biggest problems... Uh, the pr- biggest problem seems to be a lack of tolerance towards mistakes and attaching too much importance to the person rather than the content. Like it has resulted in a cult culture where either you're with us or against us. Whenever someone makes any mistake, it is free license to attack the person and disregard hundreds of the other goods that he might have done. One such example was Sheikh Yasser Qadi and Yatjuj and Matjuj. He has done numerous great lectures and has an extensive Sira series on YouTube and people called for boycott for everything that he's done slash taught. It's a bit extreme to have this mindset as people make mistakes. Even for him, many times he makes clear what his personal views is on matters, what the majority views are and what other views ulama hold. The ease of social media has also amplified the situation as far away as Singapore. Uh, We here in Singapore know of the fights between groups and sometimes get vested in watching refutations after refutations. Alhamdulillah, I've managed to stop doing that and busied myself with other things. Personally, I started practicing because of the da'wah by some YouTube and speakers corner videos. Then to see individuals refuting really lowered my iman. At times thinking, why is the culture so toxic? Some groups show respect in debating enemies of Islam people who are literally attacking Islam left, right and center, but can't even show half the respect towards their Muslim brothers. That really made me think, like, why do they make the culture so toxic with refutations after refutations? In the end, it really is no point getting caught up in the small issues like many do. If you follow a ruling, still part of Ahlul Sunnah or Jama'ah, and it's wrong, if you put in proper effort and was convinced of it, Allah will show mercy if it's wrong. On your muqiyama, uh, on your muqiyama, Allah is going to ask you first of your salah and then things like zakah, fasting, hajj, salaq, etc. Allah is probably not going to ask why didn't you follow Sheikh X or why did you didn't you refute this group? With the problems in the community, like people not frequenting the masjid and youths being cultural Muslims, we should give them dawah instead of start uh, to start practicing rather than being fixated on the minor issues. Many times we watch a two-hour lecture and think that we know more than someone who spent five to six years in Medina University. It's a weird satisfaction we get when we prove someone more knowledgeable wrong. Like proving your teacher in school was wrong in something makes your peers look up to you. The layman should just stay in their lane and not try to actively look look out for the fault in others. Mm. The end. (laughs) <laughs> wow okay uh mm. let's just dissect that a little bit uh so i think that 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 response is a very it's it's a good response but i think it's not as balanced as it needs to be uh okay. from my opinion i think i think we're either affected a lot by uh this this concept of refutations um I think neither the, the the majority, I say majority, but neither the, the most famous refuters that we see in this day and age are aware of the etiquettes, nor are the the laymen that mm. get exposed to it are aware of its importance. Okay, you know? that's a good I think, point. And I think, I think uh, what what's happening is we're falling into a, an arena where many people are sort of shunning off refutations as a whole. Yeah. Um, because it, it's uh, it's not just controversial, but 
it's something that they can't handle and feels like it's damaging to their belief system and damaging to the Ummah, right? Mm. Um, and with, in all honesty, if it wasn't for a refutation of any kind, uh-huh. a lot of us would be following the wrong sort of yeah, path. Because right, yeah. how many mistakes have we made when we started practicing and then we realized, oh, actually, I shouldn't be believing in that or I shouldn't be listening to this person, etc. Um you know, and I can think, I'm not going to name names, but I can think of people right now in my head that actually, when I look back at what they were preaching, I'm like, oh my God, that's insane. <laughs> and I was listening to that all the time. Um, refutations have their place in the deen. And, and it's and if you ask, I know there was an example that he's just given regarding, he or she, sorry, just given um, regarding what would Allah ask you about. It, it's possible that Allah would ask you about enjoying the good and forbidding the evil. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's um, quite a big deal, isn't it? And that's, that is quite a big deal. Maybe mm-hmm. you know, not specifically this sheikh or that sheikh. Yeah, um, but, but in a in a specific, uh, when you have the ability to exactly do something, yeah. and you, you're in the obviously you're in the right place, right kind of qualifications, if you mm-hmm. like, then yeah, you will be asked about mm-hmm. that. And, and just yeah. and just because of that doesn't mean that that means everybody now has the expertise and the right to yeah. start doing yeah. engaging in this. But mm-hmm. it does mean that there are people that are going to be out there that are qualified to do so. That mm. feel the need to do so, mm-hmm. and that and that's because they believe they will be questioned about it because mm. they have the capacity to. Yeah. Um, so, what's important is to find balance. I think, and I'm mm. not speaking. At, you know, I wouldn't want to speak out of my own tongue for this. I believe this is something that a lot of the ulama uh, preach. It's about finding balance. Um, now, if it's somebody that, uh, what I've learned is, you know. I, I used to get involved in these these refutations and stuff when it was people that I didn't even listen to anyway, um, mm. and it was just like further cementing my belief in them when actually that was just wasting my time. Um, and it's it's something similar that Mufti said. I know we always quote him, but he quoted someone else. Like he quoted a president who said, "You know, my friends don't need it; my enemies won't believe it." Um, like the people that listen to uh, such, you know controversial speaker x for example they probably always will uh unless they come out with their own sort of uh belief system this is generally speaking and the people that don't listen to him will never you know the, the reputation doesn't necessarily benefit them in a the sense that it changes something about them so for example like this, this individual is given the example of yasir qadi right Mm-hmm. If you don't agree with the refutation, then it doesn't shouldn't really bother you that much because people are always going to have people that disagree with them. You know, mm. everyone's refuted by someone, whether that mm. person who's refuting them is either on the Sirat al Mustaqim or not. You know, yeah. Um, for example, puts you know, exit out of the Muslim spectrum for a, a second. All of Islam is being refuted by people. Not saying they're correct in doing so, mm. but. That's the reality. That's the reality we live in. If yeah. it wasn't for refutations, we wouldn't be as sharp as we are. We wouldn't be as yeah. as as you know. We wouldn't put such heavy importance on on clarifying mm. our sources, on yeah, making exactly. sure everything is you know up to date. Yeah. Then there's then there's the level of refutation where there's character assassinations. That's where you can start thinking, okay, this is a bit personal now. This isn't yeah. necessarily. If I'm and not, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, yeah. a refutation in its you know, most people, Muslims, unfortunately, the only way they have heard of the word refutation is from this context, right? Mm. But there is such thing as like refuta- refuting an idea, refuting a, a theory, yeah. yeah, refuting a fact, a claim, yeah? yeah. That is something that is it, throughout all of academia, you know, yeah. in science, in humanities, in history. People, they, I don't know if, if the correct usage of refute is I refuted. Uh, Abdullah, you know, it's yeah. more like I refuted this uh, claim or this theory. Yeah, as far it, as I know, it's a dirty. It's become a dirty word in the community. It's yeah. definitely become a dirty word where immediately because people aren't used to using that terminology, so people mm. have associated it with a particular type yeah. of behavior. I mean, if you think about our previous episode when we were talking about voting and stuff, essentially mm. we were we were just debating and refuting each other's arguments, mm. you know, yeah. and, and in essence, and there's a, there's an etiquette to it, and it should be mm. something that both sides love. Mm. Like I remember being at university and having to um, essentially refute people's arguments based on you know research and stuff. So you would you would ch- set yourself a task of asking a question, you know, maybe challenging a theory. 
Mm. And then using your research to gather information and gather evidence to challenge that theory. And that would essentially, that document yes. would essentially be a refutation. And yes. that's what the ulama would do. They would, the ulama yes. would, would compile, you know, um, pieces mm. of Reasons work. Reasons why would, X is yeah, wrong. Yeah. Pieces mm. of work that would essentially refute someone else's idea. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's essentially what it should be. So, mm. you know, I'll be honest. I think the Siyas al-Qadi issue that, that happened... Um, uh, as an example, because that's the example that was given, I saw I saw a few quote unquote refutations that were actually quite um, quite what's the word sound in the sense that they provided the evidence, they found a counter argument, mm. and mm. they um, and they addressed the, they addressed the disagreement, and mm. it was void of any sort of character assassination or mm. or this is what you know this individual is X Y Z and blah 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 blah. Um, and it was done with love and compassion, and that's how it should be between you know yeah. members of the ummah. And there's yeah. obviously there's going to be people that take that to extremes, just like with anything. But yeah. to to say uh, we have to basically give the term refutation back its its right because it, it has got an important yeah. place in Islam. It's just about having mm. that balance, you know. And I think yeah. this individual was mentioned about speaker's corner. Um, speaker's corner is essentially just ref- refutations left, right, and center. Like that's what we do there. Um, yeah, and that can deaden the heart a bit because suddenly your dean only becomes mm. argumentation. And, and this individual said that mm-hmm. they, um, that's what sort of, if I'm correct, that's what sort of turned them into a practicing Muslim, right? Yeah, yeah. they started practicing because of you. What, yeah, what I think yeah. my advice, Wallahu alam, and I something I need to take for myself is that you have to sort of look into yourself and realize what are you ready for now. Like what what stage of your dean are you in now? Because there is a yeah. time where that you know that speaker's corner environment, those sort of videos that is good for you like oh yeah i need to understand about this argument or i have this doubt in my mind how can it be answered you know this is like early stages and everybody's got their own sort of thing that brought them into practicing and then after a while you can't just stay stuck on that forever because you need to start gaining knowledge you need to start putting importance like for myself you know i'd argue that where i should be now what i should be doing now um, and this is based on the behaviors i've seen from my peers in um, the in the community is, is putting all of that st- stuff to the side, putting all these lectures to the side, putting everything to the side, and actually focusing on the Qur'an, focusing on understanding the Qur'an, focusing on my Arabic, focusing on my memorization. Because I've, I've realized in myself, I've had years of that, of, you know, boosting my Iman, X, Y, Z, I'll just stick on a lecture, I'll stick on a video. Mm. That has become my deen, right? And, and, I'm, and I realized up until recently, um, oh, my son's crying. <laughs> I realized up until recently, I'm not really learning anything new in the sense that, I can die happy. I can mm. die saying I've achieved something. It's been a long time since I've challenged mm. myself to something new. And, and and I've seen recently how there's brothers that I sort of started practicing with and now they've just engrossed themselves in studying mm. the Qur'an, in memorizing the Qur'an, in learning mm. its meanings and learning Arabic. And actually, wallahi alayhi, the way that they speak about the Qur'an, it's almost like they've discovered something mm. that is like hidden that I understand they've seen it's like they've seen something that you will never mm. see it's like th- the way they describe certain mm. ayat or certain miracles of the quran actually, it's like incredible the smile that they have on their face um mm. and it's like well i want a mm. bit of that what's stopping me from getting that so that's you know and, and considering our busy lifestyles considering all the response certain amount of time dedicated to any part of deen in terms of mm. extra sort of gaining knowledge or extra ibad or whatever so you need to start tailoring that to something a bit more beneficial because chances are those few hours you get caught up on whether it's refutations mm. or whatever or then it's kind of wasted in a way mm. um but yeah ultimately they have its place, it has it's its place. Like, uh, and that's that's if, you know, if that's we didn't have this it. culture <laughs> of verifying things whether it's the chain of narration whether it's the narrators and you know what's known as ilm uh, rijal you know um the knowledge of men basically the narrators not you know the biographies of the narrators and were they trustworthy people or not if we'd and it, you know some of the narrators they wouldn't be trustworthy and you have to say it right and if we didn't have that then we wouldn't have you know so, so much trust um in our hadith tradition uh so yeah and then you end up mm. you know like where christianity maybe has gone these days where with so many different versions and it seems very subjective as to what the truth is um, so uh, that's a good point like if we mm. don't have any sort of corrections in between ourselves correcting each other holding each other 
to account for what we've claimed is is what Allah has said, then we go eventually mm. we go lost definitely. So definitely um, correcting each other has has its place, and it just has to be in the right way, like you said. It has to be mm. based on what was said and not the person so much, and it needs to. This yeah. is it. It's like mm. you, like you've just mentioned. It's I think our averseness to it is a symptom of our important you know mm. yeah, either, all, all the sheikh is doing whoever it is it should be transmitting the quran and sunnah yeah that's a good so point. if they yeah if they're being refuted with the quran and sunnah mm. then you yeah, should be exactly. able to so, remove yeah. them that's from your heart do, and focus yeah. just on the quran and sunnah the evidence is no matter who's bringing it yeah mm. Mm. yeah that's yeah and that's happened to me at least one main time that i can think of where somebody that you know, I, I listened to so much and I looked up to so much and I, you could say, followed so much and benefited from so much. And then I start seeing some things that, you know, not really convinced. Uh, they're always coming with what I'm looking for, at least. Yeah. And, and that was, you know, it was very uncomfortable. But, but now, years later, where am I? I still respect that person. Mm. I still think they've benefited the Ummah greatly. Mm. It's just in one kind of area where I'm like, yeah, not sure about that. But it's not about the person. It's just about certain things being mm. said. So I think that's a big, a big difference. And there's a difference, yani Allah Allah, but there's a difference between correcting someone's claim or someone's argument and doing like jarhu ta'adi, like actually saying this person as a person, yeah. um, you know, they shouldn't be taken from whatever. That's that's a different thing. Yeah. And both. It's like both is ijtihad. It's something that, you know, you need to be qualified to do. And it's down to people's reasoning, you know. Um, but yeah, let's move on, bro, because we spent a Sorry, lot, yeah. lot of time on it. Th thank you so much for the for this uh, comment. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. Uh, it's actually from a university email, Singapore, all the way from Singapore. All the way from Singapore. Right, let's go... Uh... Oh God! This this one. Okay, let's skip this one. I keep skipping this one. It's been since the twentieth of April. Maybe we shouldn't <laughs> skip it. It's then. not that. It's because it's a whole topic suggestion. So it would. Ah, uh, okay, got it. it. Yeah. I'll I'll have a look at that another time. Okay, um, here we go. This one. Uh, this is from our curious cat, and you can send us stuff on uh, curiouscat.me slash mind heist. Mm -hmm. Pod, I believe. I think that's it. Mm. Oh, just go to oh, my podcast. Go to my pod. Yeah. Go to my nice podcast. Dot com and everything's on there. Anyway, mm. uh, the too long didn't read section of this is: Do you think certain Stoic beliefs could align with Islamic beliefs and ideals? Anyway, the full question mm. is: Assalamu alaikum. Just wanted to start off by thanking you guys for keeping up the podcast. I find it really insightful to hear people dissect their opinions and thoughts on things in a way that would have never crossed my own mind. Uh, may Allah continue to place barakah in this endeavor of yours. I've noticed Ahi to be talking about a medallion he was gifted on Instagram, and that got me thinking about the philosophy of Stoicism, which I know little about, but what I do know does intrigue me. My question is, do you guys believe any of the teaching of Stoicism can align with Islamic beliefs and ideals? If so, which ones do you guys think are useful? If you've made it this far, congratulations. Uh, regards, an avid listener. Also, here's an article I've been reading on Stoicism, which you guys might find interesting, and it's essentially an, an article from dailystoic.com uh, mm. forward slash what is Stoicism, a definition, three Stoic exercises to get you started. Uh, mm. Stoicism, Achi. Stoicism. Mm. Uh, what do you? What, what's, what's your response to this? Um, I think, firstly, a few things. Yeah, go for it. The truth is the truth. Mm. Okay, and I think the truth sometimes is found in traditions other than our own, and that is because it is the truth. Mm. Yeah, and Allah Alam where all the over 120,000 messengers were sent and mm. where they went and what what places they were and obviously everywhere they went they were bringing with them the truth you know mm. and these wisdoms so sometimes i think like these uh, wisdoms that a lot of different cultures and and religions or philosophies adopt maybe they all came from these messengers allah mm. adam you know um so the, the truth is the truth, um, no matter where it comes from, yeah? And secondly, the 
uh, like uh, is this the hadith I believe right al hikmatu dalatul mu'min the 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 wisdom is the lost property of the believer yeah he takes it wherever he finds it this um so as long as that what therefore what that means is that if you find something it obviously you need certain grounding in your religion to even judge if something is uh against or uh, 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 lines up with or is just kind of neutral with it when it comes to islam but you know, if something doesn't go against Islam, then it might be, and it, it seems to be wise, and it makes sense to you. Then that's good, right? That's your property because mm. you're the you're a believer in charge. It's your property. You take that. Um, and so, I'm just starting it by saying that because whatever it is, stoicism, communism, feminism, all these things, and you know, sometimes I'm talking harsh against feminism, but we could say definitely the things in feminism that uh, are also in Islam, mm. right? It might be that 90% is not in Islam, but it's good. I like, I remember Muhammad Hijab, he started talking about feminism by uh, admitting certain overlap between Islam and feminism. And I think it's a good way to approach that kind of discussion. Mm. So, for example, with feminism, uh, we would agree that a man and woman have equal um, uh, value, you know, like we would say in the in the eyes of Allah. You know, so that's something we could agree with. Mm. With communism, we could say that we don't want uh, too too much um, wealth, or if you like, to accumulate in a way that ends up being oppressive. You know, we want some uh, movement of wealth between different classes of people, right? So, you know, even though communism ended up being a big mistake, a big flop, and many things are uh, against Islam, we have to start with the point of. Yeah, some of these things are, are in line with Islam. So anyway, to go to Stoicism, from the what I know of Stoicism, you know, I've read uh, and heard about it quite a lot from people like Tim Ferriss, Ryan Holiday. Um, they go on and on about it. I kind of feel like it's the new age thing where it's like finding spirituality, finding purpose without needing, with, not without needing, but without taking on the rules that usually come with it. Mm. Yeah. Um, so... I think a lot to be to be brief. Uh, I think a lot of it is in line with Islam, but I can't say everything is, no. and I don't know everything in order to actually say that. So, yeah, I think for myself, um, f for myself, it's. I wouldn't say I've studied the whole. F I don't know what you want to call it—a philosophy or a. Or a yeah, movement. philosophy. Mm. I'm a bit averse to calling it a philosophy. I don't know if that's a loaded sort of term. Anyway, okay. Um, I don't know though. I don't know. Um, mm. For me, I obviously stumbled upon one of the books uh, from Ryan Holiday, and to me, it, it came across as a a mode of thinking that was very much in line with Islam that I know that Islam would have promoted. Um, but it was more. I think it's a symptom of my lack of understanding of Arabic and my lack of under my lack of ability to dive into what I believe already exists in our in our dean in terms of writings and works by scholars right I believe that I'm sure that if I was to study the Arabic language and be proficient in it then works such as this with this you know with this much insight especially coming from a Muslim perspective already exist mm. um, I think it's a, the reason why a lot of Muslims are getting into these particular books is because they speak to they speak to us with things that we are familiar with in a language that we essentially understand quite well. Um, mm -hmm. So the way that, I don't know, Ego is the Enemy, for example, talks about the ego, its yeah. harms, what, and gives you modern-day sort of examples, um, ways of thinking. None of that, from what I can remember, none of that sort of message is counter to Islam. In fact, it is promoted by Islam. We talk about battling yeah. the nefs, the jihad, the nefs, that kind of element, right? So to me, it shed, yeah. sheds light in a way, in a tone that um, is beneficial and, um, what's the word, complementary to what Islam teaches. So for me, I believe these books could have easily been written by a Muslim, right? Mm. It's, and could have been written better by Muslims, especially mm. if they were using examples from the Quran and Sunnah okay mm -hmm. in yeah. all honesty my biggest critique and I've mentioned this before I don't know if I mentioned it to you but my biggest critique mm -hmm. of these books is how they're very 
Eurocentric slash Western centric. Like all of the mm. examples that are given are people that I don't identify with and never have. And essentially, they use certain people as examples of these kind of characteristics that I wouldn't agree with all of their life choices, and I wouldn't agree with the outcome and, mm. and some of the bad things they've done in their lives. Okay, um, mm. I do see the the benefit of using those examples, but you know, I, I always uh, I find an affinity to the message that's being given, but I don't click with any of the examples that are given. Um, unless it's some, it's an example of someone that did something catast- catastrophically wrong. And um, for example, at the moment, I'm, I was reading um, "Stillness is the Key." I don't know how far you mm-hmm. got with that. Um, mm, finished. Okay, there was a section about Tiger Woods and how. Yeah. So essentially, I thought initially when he started talking about Tiger Woods, I thought, oh, he's going to start promoting Tiger Woods's, you know, professionalism and how great he was at this sport, etc. Yeah. And this is why. Yeah. But then I realised it was actually a critique of. The, the the maybe more his or less dad, yeah, yeah his his father's uh, the way the father up, uh, brought him up and also his behavior and lashing out and how that led to him having affairs and how that led to him you know so mm. the message there was like oh that's quite important like look how this mm. you know that's a that's an important critique uh, an important critique of Tiger Woods for example and using his mentality mm. and how, the way he was raised same thing with uh with uh, Michael Jordan like they were given examples of people that the ego overcame them. And, and this is how it sort yeah. of plays out, and that was important to me because yeah. I find that in everyone, and I find that in a lot of non-Muslims, for example, mm. and celebrities. Anyway, mm. but what, what I've said, and what many people have said, I remember speaking to Musa Adnan about this as well. Um, we all sort of have discovered this kind of these books, but we are hungry for it to be written from a Muslim perspective, and I think it mm-hmm. will happen sooner or later. And I think this is mm. why it's important for us to to maybe read this sort of stuff because you know I would love to I would love to be in a position one day to maybe be able to write a book that is more geared towards Muslims that is specific for Muslims yeah. that lays out these ideas that we have in a form that is easy to digest because um, without uh, I don't know I'm not trying to disregard the way this, the, the, the way that the Islamic words are written out today because the, the ulama that have produced the works that they have whether as translations or exegesis or whatever of the Quran and Sunnah I think it, maybe it, it hasn't been uh, I don't know easily adopted by people this day and age because I, I maybe writing styles are different for example like I, I, there's books like by Ibn al-Qayyim um, mm that I've got here and I've read those books and I think a lot of those books have those gems in them um, mm-hmm. but I don't think they are adapted to uh, give modern day examples that we can associate yeah. with so yeah that's one thing yeah I think that's the other thing I would say is the translation sometimes is not translated into uh, an English that mm. we are used to mm. and the thing is I think they it's a translation it's not a, a, a new book mm. and therefore the style which we're not used to is taken from the original version mm. and it's just copied mm. and so we're not used to that style maybe it doesn't flow so much for us I think so that's just a few things yeah. it's essentially maybe the, the most important thing I think these these sorts of books do scratch the itch of is that as we've you know named our podcast quite aptly Mind Heist I think mm. we do live in a day and age where we are bombarded by all sorts of you know stimuli from media social media advertisements uh, talk on the street news things that i don't think uh, as as ryan holiday maybe does put i don't think there was a level of stillness that we have now that we don't have now sorry that existed in the past like there is mm. really a, a, this lack of calmness and nothing you know nothingness and the, the ability to think um and we're not really exposed to that as much generally speaking mm-hmm. with the nine to five and things going on all the time yeah. it's very busy life's very fast <clears throat> yeah so i think there is a uh, room for for people to approach this sort of idea and this concept and this mindset management from the dean because the dean has got all the answers you know and uh, we're mm. not shying away from that the religion has got all the answers i think um it's just it just requires a bit more work and a bit more um exploration to, to to find the specific remedies that you're looking for in your life um yeah for- i mean some of the, the the big hitters um in terms of what you're talking about this kind of book this genre of book for the muslims is books like don't be sad 
you know that yeah. that's a that's a classic everyone yeah. loves that book yeah. every you know everyone read that book in arabic english that was a big one and it can maybe it's like what you're saying it's proof that people want this mm, definitely mindset like you know it's, it's self-help essentially and and i think what, what a lot of muslims fall into is picking up books that are translated information and then not knowing how to apply that to their own mm. sort of mm. behavior adequately mm. um yeah. and i think yeah there is a there is a market for it and i think there will yeah. be sooner or later i think there will be muslims that, that bridge that gap um yeah I can already think of some Muslims that would be brilliant if they, you know, put some pen to paper. I think they'd be brilliant mm. in translating that sort of methodology and that sort of mindset management because mm. that otherwise, if you can't, if you don't get that from a book, then you would get that from a teacher. I think like someone who was in front of yes. you that could advise you about specific issues, um, yes. g- generalities. And for a lot of us, mm. unfortunately, we don't have a teacher present in that sort of sphere of things. Mm. And it's going to mm. be, it would have to be a teacher that is aware and um, aware of, certain things that the general populace go through um yeah you know in terms of this sort of exposure um mm. but yeah so if we just sort of conclude the question oh i've already answered it now i don't remember what it said but yeah mm-hmm. i wouldn't say like i think it's also you know there is that danger danger towards it because there are going to be things in 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 any of these books that aren't okay for us you know that we do disagree mm. with um, and I don't want to start saying, as this question may imply, oh, I believe in stoicism and I believe in this and this is you know my way of life and blah blah blah. Mm. I don't, and that's why I said before, like calling it a philosophy for me, I don't want to start saying, oh, I read other philosophies or I'm into that kind of thing. Um, mm. What it is for me is I'm I'm essentially translating what the dean already promotes in a language that resonates with me because then what I can do is I take some of that from from that book for example whether it's a quote whether it's an idea and I realize it yeah it matches up with this in the religion and then I can use that as fuel and motivation for myself and a better understanding of myself um and it is it is quite phenomenal that there are a lot of things that are that do that they share you know for example or mm-hmm. remembering death uh, mm-hmm. Killing the ego, um, giving you know having this. Uh, I remember recently in one of the books, it was talking about the the necessity to believe in something bigger than yourself, mm. uh, the necessity to believe in a higher being. And obviously, he didn't call mm. it you know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, didn't call it God, but it's 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 fascinating to see that there's certain people that have no deen in a sense in terms of Islam, but their search for truth sort of brings them to what we'd say aligns to Islam and, mm. and it goes back yeah. to what you were saying earlier like the truth is there all the time like the truth has always been there and we are all human beings like we we whether we're Muslim or not so we all suffer from the same things and we do all see we, we may, will all see the same sort of problems that need solutions alhamdulillah for us we've relinquished ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so our, our solutions are there on paper for us at the mm-hmm. moment, you know, the Quran and the Sunnah. For a lot of these non- people that don't have that, they're searching for it. And yeah, sometimes they mm. will get close to the truth. So, and some aspects they'll hit the nail on the head, you know, because yeah. Yeah. we're all living the same human experience. Uh, yeah. And Allah's kind of programmed us to look for the truth yeah. if we're sincere. It's a, imagine you were, I don't know, it could be anything. It could be some, an illness. Imagine you had an illness, right? And you have been gifted with the knowledge of knowing that this certain drug you know um treats the illness very well you know it cures it Mm. you know it could be anything it could be a cold for example right but then your neighbor who isn't been gifted with it is trying all sorts of home remedies okay Mm. and actually finds something that that does treat his illness Mm. maybe that thing that he's found was already Mm. in the drug that you've had you know that was part of the core ingredients they've scratched the surface and they found something civilizations have have found solutions to problems whilst others sort of get close almost get there but then they try something completely different and veers them off mm. um, alhamdulillah we've been blessed and I think it's important to to thank Allah all the time about the blessings that we have we can easily say with our you know hands on our hearts that the Quran and Sunnah are the solution to all these issues and we should feel 
maybe a, a level of pity for people that are still out there searching mm. because think about it these books these self-help books that Muslims are fascinated with are feeding or attempting to feed this hunger that they've got for guidance um, desperately want guidance you can tell by the way they're writing these books that they're speaking to a people that are desperate for guidance that yeah. want some sort of path in life to follow that want a set of rules mm. <laughs> and to think we we speak to non-Muslims that have an averse reaction to religion because they hate being told what to do and they hate rules and they don't want to be limited yeah. uh, you know in their eyes but then you get this other group of people that are like desperate for rules and regiments and routine mm. you know and, and habits mm. and and without all of this and without submitting to something higher than themselves they're lost and they're just mm. you know Baishin as you'd say in Arabic <laughs> <laughs> but yeah yeah um, just a few few more thoughts I had while you were talking um, one of the kind of founders of this of Stoicism I can't remember who it was maybe it was Seneca he actually how did he die he killed himself oh, right. yeah so you know, obviously, these these are the kind of things we don't want to follow follow them in. And by the way, you know how he killed himself, or why he killed himself? It's because I think he was found to be part of a plot against the emperor. Okay. Oh. Okay. And what what did the emperor do? He had somebody deliver a knife or something to the guy's house, and basically, it was in their tradition that it's like I'm not going to kill you; you have to kill yourself. Yeah. So. If he had refused to kill himself, then they would have killed him anyway, or something. Uh. So, but he did. He did kill himself. Um, he slit his wrists and stuff, and he sat in a bath. It was some kind of tr- tradition, some messed up tradition. Oh right. So uh, that's that's something to think about. Obviously, we don't want to follow people that went that way, you know. But um, mm. in in this article that they've linked, um, there are like nine exercises of stoicism. Right. I thought we could quickly go through them and see what lines up with Islam. So the first, it says, practice misfortune. Yeah, something that rings a bell for me of this is, it's like, uh, I think Umar al-Khattab, he said, you know, prepare for a day when you won't have what you have now. Yeah, mm. so don't get too soft and, and you know, cushy and, and get used to that. It's not hadith or anything, but it's not something Umar al-Khattab said. Train perception to avoid good and bad. So uh, Marcus Aurelius said, choose not to be harmed and you won't feel harmed. Don't feel mm. harmed, and you haven't been. Yeah. So I can I can think of certain things where Allah changes our paradigm shift to to see things differently. So, for example, uh, in Surah uh, Al Imran, Allah says, "Adab al Imran says, wa tahinu wa la tahzanu wa antum al-alauna in kuntum mu'minin." Don't uh, don't be weak and don't be scared, and you'll be uh, you'll be given the upper hand if you're truly believers yeah Mm. and this is and you could say um how do i choose not to be weak but it's kind of like almost like allah saying no being weak is what you choose to you know if you got the weak mentality right and you don't have the tawakkul and stuff that's how you become weak so allah's ordering you not to be weak and not to be um sad as though it's in our control and it is in control. How? In kuntum mu'minin, if you're truly believers. You know, obviously mm-hmm. being a true believer comes with having tawakkud. So that's something that came across my mind. It's it's, it's the same with the, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in regards to the affair of the Muslim is always good. Yes, yes. Uh, next, remember it's all eph- ephemeral. I think that means everything will come to an end. And obviously there's an exact ayah about this, which is... Um, كل من عليها فان everything will come to an end ويبقى وجه ربك ذو الجلال والإكرام everything will come to an end and the face of Allah will stay uh, you know eternally um, and that's a funny thing is see we've got something exactly like this except we're adding this thing of no but Allah is eternal Allah stays forever yeah 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 right uh, next is take the view from above I'm guessing this is about seeing, uh, zooming out, seeing the bigger picture. Uh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head from Islam, but probably there is. I mean, this is kind of, uh, I don't know, common sense. Take well, it a step it, back. It, 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 can, it can be, mm. it can be, I don't know if it's a direct link, like a direct saying, but mm. it's the concept of, you know, things happening for a reason. There's always going to be a reason mm. why Allah yes. has chosen yeah. for certain Iman things to Yeah, yeah, so you know something happens that you just can't mm. understand why. Yeah. 
but you have to force yourself to separate yourself from that situation mm. and, and do a bit of mental gymnastics like something I would practice is mental gymnastics of thinking okay what could possibly be a reason for this to happen just to sort of yeah. swallow that pill mm. a bit easier mm. and I will think of things there will always be yeah. things yeah. you know it could be anything as simple as you know your car breaking down on the way somewhere mm. and you're like why would this happen I really wanted to go to this it was going to be benefit but I think you know it could be all sorts of things can yeah. happen on avoided that journey avoided a car you know, accident avoided. or whatever yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. things like that yeah. so. and the difference again is that we believe <coughs> that Allah is is active in our life whereas mm. this is just taking a step back and kind of I don't know really what they're trying to say okay next is <laughs> memento mori so meditate on your death on your mortality so of course we have that you know visiting the graves um, mm. and uh, for example the hadith um, whoever loves to meet Allah then Allah will love to meet him uh, mm. you know I'm, I'm but, obviously proud you know that. on that mm. it's it's important I think we discuss mm. the, the, the key difference there is that for them it's the end and for us it's it's a beginning mm. like we're thinking of death in a different sort of yeah paradigm we're thinking of death in the sense that remember death because this is what you're going to answer about mm. like this right now but they're like remember death because you won't achieve the dunya you mm. won't like, attain the basically dunya they're saying you... yolo <laughs> yeah they're saying you're running out of time yeah. achieve what you want in the dunya mm. we're saying you know you're running out of time mm. you're, you're going to answer for this mm. like okay that's interesting you understand it's kind of showing that their focus is on for example you stub your toe, you're in so much pain, you're fed up, and then you're like, oh, I'm, I'm going to die, right? So it'll bring you back yeah. to the bigger picture. Whereas for yeah. us, yes, that would help us in that sense as well, but it's also reminding us of any pain in this life or any uh, effort we exert in this life for the sake of Allah. It's mm. it's coming, you know, well, 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 uh, well, uh, you know, well, akhiratu, uh, well, akhiratu khayru abqa, or, mm. um, وَالْعَقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ You know, this kind of mm. thing. Uh, number six, is this within my control? So that's obviously uh, being able to differentiate between what's in your control, what isn't. If it's not in your control, mm. then uh, you could just let go of it. But uh, we have some a better version of this, I would say, where it's like, uh, I, I saw something on Twitter one day, it's like, Alhamdulillah, nothing's in my control. Yeah? So it's mm. like knowing that Allah is in control of everything, that's way better than having this thing of oh that's in my control that's not in my control no actually nothing's in your control but that's a good thing next is journaling uh i don't know if we have that specifically um but hey uh, yeah um, that's a bit of a but you know what yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to you know live in squeeze something out of nothing okay but i suppose for, for them it's it's having this conversation isn't it and if you have no if you have no really and truthfully if you don't believe that you have a lord that you can speak to yeah then then they have to let it out somehow mm, yeah um so for us we've got the obviously dua for example that conversation you can have with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah for us we've also got the concept that well it depends how deeply you think about it but for me like i know that every conversation i've ever had with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never be forgotten by him mm, you know mm. um I may and think the angels are journaling for you as well. The angels are journaling <laughs> for you, but it, it gives you a level of of solace that you know that Allah knows every single issue you've ever had, every mm. single problem you've ever had, every experience you've ever had. Yeah. You can entrust that into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. You let it out and you can entrust that into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even yeah. though you've forgotten the du'as you've made mm. a year ago, they could come through mm. and you forgot that you even mm. made those du'as. Yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah. Um, I, I do think there's a there's an element of journaling which we could say it's absent from Islam, but there is, there's, there's beneficial elements to journaling um, that we could take on purely for the benefit that it brings you, you know, like getting mm. clarity on your thoughts and stuff like that. Mm. Um, next is practice negative visualization. So <laughs> I don't know about this one. Um, well, I'd say that, you you know, as the Prophet Sassanam said about... Um, you know, don't look at those who are higher, like mm. better than you. That it could be something in the sense that you are visualizing the things that you, the blessings that could be taking away. You, you're visualizing, you know, the th things could yeah. be worse than they are now, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. I guess one way I try and think about it is, wherever I am, let's say, even if things are relatively, 
Yeah. Like, let's say I'm, everything's okay in life, you know? It's okay, alhamdulillah, it's good. I try and think of, okay, I'm way better off than most people on earth. If I was to go down a step, down a level, I would be okay. Like, yeah. I'd deal with it. Allah would hook me up, you know? So having that trust, I think, is uh, something quite powerful to know that no matter what happens, yani, we are we're fully aware, uh, at least on a logical level, that you could get paralyzed tomorrow. But just the fact that you know that, you know, the akhirah is more important and the fact that you trust in Allah and whatever qadr that comes to you is, is good, can be good for you, depending how you take it. That's a powerful thing. The last thing is love everything that happens. Is this yeah, like qadr again? Like it's, it's what we were talking about before, about the affair of a believer is always mm. good. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I think in, in summary, we could say... Um, Islam is uh, has many things in terms of these at least these nine things we listed, but it, it yeah. takes it a level higher and a level better, and of course the fact that it's directly from Allah, you know, we have the Quran from Allah, we have so let's say there's um, a certain wisdom that has been passed around generations, you know, in a culture that doesn't, you know, hasn't been in touch with Islam, yeah, and we pick that up and we're like, okay, that's cool. What would be better, that which has been passed around and maybe changed slightly and this and that, or the direct, mm. you know, juice from Quran and Sunnah? Obviously, we would say the Quran and Sunnah is better because it's like, it's more authentic. We know definitely where it came from. We can trust in it more, even if the other thing is also wise and also makes sense. So, um, if we, and it's stoicism, and it's some cool elements, uh, but I just think, like you were saying before, the way yes. it's presented yeah. is what is attracting people to stoicism. Like even us, like me and you, we're reading Ryan Holiday books. Yeah, why? It's because we like the ideas. We like how it's being presented. We we we, we like that stuff. But we're like, if if there was that kind of presentation of Islamic yeah. ideas, yeah, 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 then yeah. burn Ryan Holiday, yeah. <laughs> isn't it? And and you know, you said inshallah people will start writing books. I haven't mentioned yeah. this before, but inshallah, I'm working on something. Inshallah, and it's. It's uh, it's you know so far it's been very mind, um, yeah. mi you know, op mind opening. Is that a word? Uh, it's been it's been mind opening in yeah. terms of what truly is out there when you go to the sources. Very very good, man. Very good. So inshallah, uh, I don't want to say much more than that. But inshallah, I I, I believe definitely it, it, this this should this movement should should happen. I'm not sure how much people are going to consume that in an actual book form. But what I think is when you research for a book, when you write the book. Now you you have the knowledge to be able to uh, communicate that it, as a, as an audio book, as a podcast, Definitely. as a blog post, as a short video, as a long video. You know, so the point is to get the knowledge and spread it and communicate it in a in a, a way that's kind of effective. Um, and one book actually that came across uh, that I came across, which is kind of in this uh, league in this genre, is called With the Heart in Mind, and it is written by uh, Sheikh Mikhail Smith who's based in the US, and um, it's, it's about the emotional and moral intelligence of the Prophet Sallallahu right? So it's taking that hype of emotional intelligence, and it's like, okay, we know the Prophet Sallallahu had this, and surely he had it to the yeah. highest degree, so let's explore that, you know? So I'm looking to get get a copy of that book. They don't have Kindle version, but uh, inshallah, I'll be reading that soon. Look forward to that. Okay, um... What's the next? Uh, I'm going to go from oldest to newest. Uh, okay, Rashid, you know, big salam alaikum to Rashid because he's always sending us emails, alhamdulillah. Um, okay, so he was just talking about a uh, great episode, guys, something I believe many of us um, have slash been, uh, uh, have or are going through. Um, I think he's talking about the whole refutations thing and not knowing, like, being confused who to follow. I'm not sure if that was in the same episode. Anyway... He's talking about the issue, I think you, you mentioned it before, of um, do we assume people are, yeah. you know, guy, like if they're Muslim, you know, do we assume they're kind of on the correct path or not? Yeah. And I think that in summary, he emailed uh, Ustad Muhammad Tim Humble, and um, he, he basically is saying that uh, when you meet a person, you may well see indications of a certain belief, like a bad belief. So then you don't assume that they're on the truth. But otherwise... Presume that a person is good until you see otherwise. Um, so mm -hmm. that's basically a summary of what he was sharing with us. So Jazakallah khairan. Um, 
Okay, question about Islamic finance. Salam alaikum. I came across your podcast on Islamic finance and mortgages. Must have been a long time ago. (laughs) This is a very interesting topic. Did we actually talk about Islamic finance and mortgages? I don't know about that. We talk talk about money maybe in general? I've I've noticed a lot of people, um, a lot of listeners, Mm. when they they sort of screenshot what they're listening to, Mm. it tends to be a very old episode. I think, alhamdulillah, I think what what people are doing is Mm. what, you know, we kind of wanted is to sort of flick through see something that suits them mm. yeah 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 because they're timeless topics isn't it so so she said um this is a very interesting topic that i want to learn more on i'm a third year student doing my dissertation on islamic finance and mortgages i was hoping you could help me answer a few questions or oh, i don't know about that ideally i'd like to hold an interview okay so this is just asking okay i don't think we can help with that are you uh, do you happen to be a specialist no. in this book I pay my rent. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. This is a quick one. Then we'll go to to Curious Cat. Rashid again. Jazakallah khairan. He said, sick episode, guys. When I first read the title, I assumed it was going to be a bit dry. However, it turned out to be arguably your juiciest episode, for me anyway. So I think it's talking oh, about yeah. the last episode, the voting one. So thank you for that. Uh, okay, back to Curious Cat. Um, Assalamu alaikum brothers I just want to start off with saying how much I benefit from the podcast May Allah reward you both endlessly Uh, I am not sure if you guys talked about it already But how do you find balance in life And what practical steps could you take to find balance I'm a student and I don't juggle quite as much as you both lol But I do have quite a few things that I do Other than studying for school Such as studying the deen and a few other side things I am interested in Jazakallah khairan Um I'd assume that you're better at this than I am. I mean, <laughs> but maybe that's, I don't, uh, mm. my assumption, and it's just, just an assumption here, is that you might have more control over day to day. Like you are able to timetable things more. Am I correct in thinking that? Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I, I can, these days, especially like the last two, three months, um, definitely more control, right? Because, uh, uh, I changed over the last, you know, three to six months, pretty much uh, changed the business from being like a services business to being more like a training business, which means you're not on call of your clients. They're not as, uh, asking you questions, waiting for reports, waiting for work to be done. It's more um, in my control. So even more than before, because obviously before I was still working for mm. myself, but even more than before now, uh, I'm in control. So I know it's a rare situation. So we... Yeah, and it's obviously I think people, maybe a lot of people, you know, should aspire to get into that position. But most people are not in that position, so maybe it's not relevant for me to go through that. I don't know. <laughs> oh, it's. But I could I could share a few things that I, maybe try and make it relevant. Yeah, go for it, please. Um, so he's talking about balancing between you know different areas of life and trying to you know I guess make progress in all different areas of life. Um, you know, so the main things in life, you know, I'm guessing that you're talking about is stuff like your your health your maybe uh, your studies, yeah. uh, whether that's Islamic studies or other studies, your ibadah, um, and make, maybe making a living, maybe spending time with family. I mean, these five things are the kind of uh, common things, isn't it? Um, uh, so one key thing I try and do is I have, try and have non-negotiables that... So obviously you, you, everybody has these dreams and goals of the future, or a lot of people do, and those are things you might it might take you five to ten years to accomplish mm-hmm. them, right? You might you might need to start those in a different phase in your life. But the things that are non-negotiable now, you need to start doing them now. You need to force them into your timetable right now, right? Even if it's in a small way. And we talked about this before, like um, it doesn't matter about reaching the destination. It's about dying while you're on the path, yeah? So, for exa- so a good example of this is reading Quran. Make it a non-negotiable to read mm-hmm. Quran. Now, you might say, I'm busy. I've got work and I've got studies, let's just say, yeah? Well, I'm just talking about five to ten minutes, right? Um, and I just feel like if you live your life with certain these, it's all about habits, basically, yeah. yeah? So if you have these good habits, obviously you're praying, you're praying every day, and you're reading your Quran every day, then that will add up over time. However long Allah allows you to live, it will add up, and you just should have these non-negotiables because this is your life, your life, you know. Uh, What's the ayah? Inna hayati wa mamati wa nusuki. Uh, no. What's the ayah? Let me find it. 
you know, basically, you know, is it Ibrahim alayhi salam? He said, "My uh, life and death and everything is uh, for Allah." Mm. Let me let me actually find it because it's a very powerful ayah. Uh, let me search Mamati. Come on, why they got ads on a phone? <laughs> Come on, gotta make that. Got to pay, got to pay the hosting bills, money. I suppose. <laughs> okay, so. قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ yeah? My uh, prayer, my sacrifice, my life and my death is for Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Yeah? So obviously we know the point of, of living and the point of existing is to worship Allah. So, um, so therefore you have to have these minimum things in your life. Every day you're doing them. I would suggest that that is your prayer. Um, you're reading Quran 5-10 minutes a day minimum You could do whatever time you, allows you to do Maybe you could squeeze in fasting once a week Again, depending uh, Do your adhkar, you know, your morning, your evening adhkar or, or your after salah adhkar And these are all modular And they're things that you could do a lot of Or, or not much of But I just feel like you should have some non-negotiables When it comes to your ibadah And then it just depends on your life Like let's say like you you said you're studying Let's say you're studying full time So you got your studies Then you've got your prayer Which is what is your prayer It's it's like up to one hour a day Where you're praying If you add it all together One hour plus your thing Plus you got ten minutes Quran Okay you're living You're already quite balanced now Because you're doing your studies You're giving some time to Allah Um, Now you might You might want to add some exercise in there Maybe three times a week Um for 45 minutes or maybe you're finding you look i know i want to do that but i just don't do that so downgrade it do get a kettlebell do 10 minutes a day at home you know so um it's all about squeezing bits in rather than having these goals that are going to make you stop yeah? yeah make you give up um and just building momentum in little habits and i know i haven't read the book but i i, I really uh from what i've heard i think that atomic habits book seems to be really good in terms of establishing habits so I would pick that book up and I would uh, uh, implement it in terms of these kind of habits. Um, and another thing, like me, for example, yeah, I've got my business and I've got certain projects I'm doing, like m- maybe like passion projects, like the like the podcast and like some other things, yeah. Now, some of those projects, I'm comfortable not doing them now, like like delaying them. Unlike the non-negotiables, I'm comfortable delaying them because I recognize I can only have like two or three main focuses at any given time to actually make progress, okay? So, you know, for you it might be your studies, your, and then on top of that, some Islamic studies. And then if, if these like Ibadah habits are new to you, it might be those. So do these three things for a good, it might, however long it, you know, your studies, however long you've got left of that, do that. And whatever passion project you want to do, be like, yeah, I'll get to that. As long as Allah lets me, um, lets me uh, uh, live that long, I will get to that. Uh, I remember reading a really good blog post on uh, weight but why. And it's about thinking of your life in seven-year um, sa- periods or phases. Yeah. So if you think about it like that, seven years is enough to actually master something and achieve a great much in that area. Mm. And how many seven years do you have in your life if you live till 70, you have 10 of them. So imagine like, you know, all while you're, let's say you're working and then you have, you're working, you have your non-negotiable ibadah and they have one passion project and that passion project lasts for seven years. Imagine with consistency, how much you could achieve in seven years. And then when that seven years is over, you start a new one and you could, you could get five, six, seven of these big projects done. And you, you've committed seven years mm. to them and you've really become a master or uh, whatever it is, whatever it ends up being in that seven years. And you might decide at the end of seven years, no, I'll do another seven years on this because it's that important. It's that, you know, effective yeah. or whatever. Um, but that's another thing that allows me to balance between doing these non-negotiable habits today and then also knowing that I can only focus on two, three things at once. And therefore, I'm going to delay certain things until the next seven years. Yeah. So... I don't know if that was a bit jumbled. It's not as structured as I usually try to talk, but yeah, that's some thoughts. It's tre- what do you What do you think, bro? Because you you're always the guy who's like, yeah, but that's not realistic. So, is what 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 am I what I'm what I'm what I am saying is that is that realistic? What do you think? I'm just a negative Nancy. Clearly, uh, I think it's fascinating that people listen to us and think that we are. Um, I mean, maybe even more so you, but I, there's some level of assumption that we have a 
balanced life you know mm. it's like how do i is that what the like question says asking? yeah well it, it kind of approaches it like that mm. almost like uh, if you're going to ask me mm. how do you balance your life mm. then I'd, I'd assume there's an assumption yeah there, that's true that my life is balanced and you want that's to know true. my secret mm. Mm. um but i might just be looking for other perspectives yeah yeah possibly but yeah I, I, I need the same sort of answers mm. <laughs> um, but I think for myself it's um, sorry um, for myself it's the maybe identifying a lot of the roadblocks I have mm -hmm. like <clears throat> I'm the most productive when my mind is sort of in a good place mm. um, so what I've what I try and tackle first is my mind, mm. my mindset, what I'm, my my moods, what's affecting me mentally, mm. that sort of blocks me from doing anything productive. Mm. Because when I'm not mentally in a good place, then I really like, I don't know, I really um, disregard a lot of things that are beneficial for me, mm. <coughs> such as whether it's exercise or, <coughs> sorry. Whether it's exercise or um, you know gaining knowledge or doing some X-ray bed at or or generally speaking just being calm and, and collected and, and facing obstacles as they come, um, and I think a lot of that you know it's funnily enough there are things that you mm. can identify. For example, getting enough sleep. Like I've noticed that when I don't get enough sleep, then yeah, I 100%. struggle doing anything the next day mm. because I just can't be bothered and you know talk to me about you know being motivated out of the window i'm not interested you know i just want to get through the day mm. and go home and sleep mm. um for example i've spoken before about work and how work you know I'm, I'm, at the moment i'm trying to get to a place at work where i'm like okay now i can start focusing on other things in life but, but i won't be able to focus on other things in life until i'm at a level of of functioning at work where i'm a bit more yeah, I can put it to the side. I can go home and not think about it, kind of thing. Yes, yeah. and I'm slowly getting there. I'm slowly getting Handling there. Handling. Um, yeah. But what but do you yeah. think about, like, right now when you're not there yet? Um, could you see yourself having these kind of non-negotiables like that I'm talking about? Possibly, possibly. Uh, like, argue with me, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, why would somebody who's working nine to five? Let maybe not your job. Maybe your job's a bit more demanding than normal nine to five, but. Somebody working nine to five, is it possible they wouldn't find ten minutes to give to the Quran? If no, uh, you know, assuming I, they yeah. want to go Jannah, yeah. I think, yeah, no, I think, as you said, I think there are people that they're non-negotiables. Hmm. You know, that, that it can be done. I really do. I think, you know, like you've mentioned, I think my, I'm a bit of an outlier, but I think if I can put it in there then so can they and I think the way I try and do it for myself is that my days off are quite like they're de de definitive like yeah this is my day off right mm. so what I can do is apply my, a non-negotiable on my days off mm. um, as opposed to someone who can do a bit more which is put non-negotiables every day you know right right um, because there's a bit more structure so mm. I think yeah it's it's habit building once again it's establishing you know it's establishing something that you want to achieve and things that are building blocks to get there it just depends how much importance mm. you're going to put on it on those end goals something like learning the Quran or memorizing the Quran or something mm. to do with deen that is yeah. sh that should be a very strong thing but that also mm. relies on you having a certain level of iman for mm. a consistent amount of time um, mm. or developing a sort of discipline that doesn't waver whatsoever. Um, but we did say before, we have mentioned before, I think not too long ago on an episode, that just because you've started on a path and you waver doesn't mean that's the end of your path. You just get back on it as soon as you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's what you'll find in that Atomic Habits book, yeah. isn't it? It's like, it's very good. I think, honestly, the summary of this is أَقَلُّ uh, in. Uh, you know the small actions uh, uh, regular actions even even if they're small like that's the summary yeah so so even though you might spend eight hours at work and then only one hour on ibadah you know start somewhere start definitely be consistent 
small. Go on. Oh, but what's the lesson to learn from work? It's that when you got somebody standing over your shoulder, you do it. Yeah. You know? So yeah. maybe that's a, I don't know how you can, obviously the way to implement that would be to hire someone, but obviously mm. not everyone can afford that kind of person, but to have some kind of accountability partner, some kind of WhatsApp group, I don't know. Um, I actually joined a uh, WhatsApp group recently. It's something I've not heard of before. It's quite interesting. Uh, I'll be, I'm interested to see if it actually works and people st st uh, stay with it. And basically there's 160 of us in this WhatsApp group and the sheikh, there's a, there's a sheikh, he's a specialist in uh, tajweed and, and Quran. And what he will do is he will recite um, an ayah. So, so far he's just done, A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajeem. And he's done Bismillah. Yeah. So he'll say that. He'll explain the common mistakes people make when reciting it. And then everybody will record their own one say, saying it. And then he will correct them. Okay. So it's a lot of voice notes that he's correcting. Yeah. But that's interesting, isn't it? It's like, it's there in your WhatsApp, you know, like oh, wow. it's something small. You just res just recite Bismillah, for example, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in, in your voice note and, and send it. And something small, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and it's like an online version. It's free and all that. So these kind of things are interesting. That sounds like a big job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a lot of work for him, definitely. Inshallah, I think, you know, the first step is to just identify that you want more balance. I think that's always good. I think I think we disregard that a lot of the time. We under, underestimate the importance of identifying that there's an issue mm. and actually wanting to, to tackle it. That's, that's a good Yeah, start. before it's too late and stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really yeah. good. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, no one knows your life better than you in a sense. Allah mm. knows it better than you. So maybe first and foremost is make dua for balance, make dua for guidance. Mm -hmm. uh, ask Allah to guide you to things that are better for you and ask Allah to identify to you things that aren't good so that you can avoid mm. them and disregard them and, and minimize yeah. them mm. and um, sometimes you got to ask yourself do I really want this you know yeah do I really want to memorize the Quran for example if I really wanted to memorize the Quran I would be putting x amount of time a week to do it if I'm mm -hmm. not doing that let's be real I don't want it right? I'm speaking mm -hmm. about myself now I, how can I claim I want to memorize the Quran when I'm not putting the work in? How, I can't claim it. I would, I would make it a priority if I really wanted it. So sometimes you need the motivation. And sometimes maybe the motivation comes from something like listening to Akhira kind of series about the Akhira. Some I, I've always heard these things are very, very motivational to give you a bit of a kick and reprioritize, you know. Mm. Um, because like, so, uh, you know, I blocked... Um, all these social media things off like they're not on my phone i don't have uh, any um internet browser on my phone i don't have youtube on my phone and people might be like wow how do you do that well it's simple uh, those things were getting in my way of doing certain projects and i wanted to do the projects so it was only one thing i had to do which is remove them so it's it's about do you mm -hmm. want it or not sometimes and you got to just sit and think with yourself what do what do i want do i really want it if i do really want it what am I willing to do to do it? These kind of things. Wow. Broski. That's some good, that's some heavy hitting knowledge. You should write a book about that. <laughs> um, should we, the, maybe we can, uh, so the Islamic finance thing, that's not a thing. Um, there's one more email. Um, Salaam Alaikum guys. This is from Kareem. Salaam Alaikum Kareem. Uh, love the podcast. Keep it going. Allahumma barik. I have a question regarding your experiences living abroad in Muslim majority countries. What do you recommend before making the move? What are the best ways to make a living? How does one deal with distance to parents slash giving them their rights, etc.? And what are some of the major culture clashes that can come along? Jazakallah khair and best regards. So, he said your experiences. I know you lived in Tunisia, but that wasn't so much a, a decision... Um, of your own, was it? No, let me see. I want to read that as well. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, <sighs> living abroad. I didn't live that long, and I was too mm. young to remember a lot of the, the important mm. things that we would now. Um, like I was at school, so 
making the move. I never moved. It's going to have to be you, I mean. You've made more of these decisions. Than yeah, I have. although, again, I think I'm a bit of an anomaly as well because um, what is abroad for me? I don't even know. <laughs> like, I don't have home. Yeah. Um, so I think a good episode to listen to is episode 49 where um, I spoke with Kaya about his decision to move to the UAE from the UK. As for one thing maybe is how do you deal with distance to parents and still giving them their rights, etc. I think you just put it in your schedule to call them a minimum once a week. Some people just do it over WhatsApp. Some people do WhatsApp and they call them once a week. I know a friend of mine, he calls his parents every single day, but it's only like for 10 minutes. So you have to, that has to be a non-negotiable. And then have a, some, if possible, that's why I said to someone who's moving abroad recently, I said, you should have the intention to have uh, some kind of house that is welcoming to your parents. So if they ever did want to come and visit with you, stay with you for a week, two weeks, whatever, that is possible. And Mm -hmm. when you say, oh yeah, I've got a spare bedroom, yeah, then it becomes a really welcoming. It becomes like, yeah, I'm serious about you coming and visiting me, you know? And obviously it's good if they can, yeah. if they're not working or whatever, they can actually move with you, you know, if that's possible. Um, so just like book it in your schedule, whatever, to call them every week, every day, whatever. And then really make them feel very welcomed to visit you as much as you can. So that's, a, that's yeah. one thing. Um, when you say what's the best ways to make a living, I mean, it's, it's really completely depends on you and the country you're thinking of going to. Of course, there's there is the whole thing of um, working independent of location. So whether that's as a freelancer or as a business owner, uh, or even some companies now, they'll hire you and they don't mind that you're not in a certain country. And maybe it's a bit rare, but it does exist. Um, So so just, I don't know, those are the easier ones, Yanni. But some countries are known for English-speaking jobs, so you might want to get a... My friend was telling me yesterday, actually, if you have a CELTA, and you um, have a Western passport or an English-speaking country passport, and you have a degree, then you can you pretty much definitely would get a job in Saudi Arabia teaching English. You might be in some middle-of-nowhere village, right? But if you're single at the, at the moment, um, then that's a good way of just going, doing your umrah, maybe doing your hajj, saving up some money, tax-free, living in a Muslim country. That's a good way to start, you know? And you just need a shelter and this and mm. that. Um, other people, they, it's always good to have a skill, like a, a skill that people actually need. You know, like we know, we know yeah. developing software is a big one these days. We know um, AI is a big one. We know, um, you know, marketing is a big one. Everyone needs sales. Everyone need, needs marketing, visibility, etc. Um, you know, these skills. Like, what is a skill that's in demand? If you have an in demand skill, then you could start to dictate to people. Oh yeah, I'm going to give you this amazing skill I have. But I'm just going to work in this country or I'm living in this country, though. And maybe that gives you that yeah. leverage where they're yeah. like, oh, OK, then fine. So that's a short yeah. thing. Culture clashes. He said, what's the major culture clashes? Again, I don't know, because I, I didn't. I grew up amongst so many different cultures. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know a lot about that one. It depends, doesn't it, where you are. Each place has its own mm-hmm. culture and. Um... You know, even even the way that Islam practice, is yeah. portrayed mm. or practiced is, yeah. it can be different. Yeah. So, you know, you could have an understanding that you're practicing Muslim from here, and then you go over to a Muslim country, assuming that yeah. things will be the same. Yeah. One thing that annoys me, man, is you know, you've been to Turkey, haven't you? Um, in the Masjid oh, in yeah. Turkey, okay, the Imam he says salam, salam, and straight he goes into the uh, into the adhkar, right, and everyone does adhkar together there, right. And it drives me nuts because I'm like, you know, I like to do it myself, do it properly, this and that. And they're like, I, I, I'm very easily distracted. So like if they're doing their oh, right. card out loud, I cannot focus to do it myself. So that's kind of annoying. Yeah. Uh, but one one really a thing I really loved about uh, Turkey, all the imams seem to have memorized the Quran properly. They all know it. And they will regularly recite it after Salah. So after Salah, they finish the adhkar and then they might recite some ayat and you know if you have the time and stuff you sit and you listen they recite very well uh, it's all from memory 
and it's all different parts of the Quran. So you, that's what how you know that they've fully memorized it. Um, very good. And I really mm. enjoy that that part of it. So yeah, different different uh, ways of doing it in uh, in the UAE after Salah. You know, it's every man for himself. <laughs> some uh, get up straight away. Yeah, some yeah, yeah. stay and do the adhkar. Um And actually, interesting. Uh, I forgot who said this to me, but maybe because in the non Arabic speaking countries, um, the people need more guidance on how to do stuff like adhkar. Maybe that's how the idea of doing adhkar together came about. It's like we don't know how to do adhkar, so the imam does it and they follow. And then maybe that just stayed and stayed and stayed until now it's like a tradition. Could be. It's all sorts of, yeah, it could be that people just assume they was part of the, the prayer yeah. itself and then mm. one thing led to another kind of thing. Yeah. And it's it's also it's almost bad, like it seems to be that it's almost bad to get up before they finish. Mm. Before they finish the adhkar. So they do the adhkar together so quickly, by the way. They do it so quick. And then he'll finish the adhkar. And then he'll say, Al-Fatiha. And then everyone recites Fatiha very quickly. And then you're allowed to get up. But before that, nobody will get up. Even though, of course, the adhkar and stuff, it's, it's not obligatory. So it's interesting, really. <laughs> okay. Culture Clash 101. <laughs> we should do one every week. For <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Should we do one more, I think? One more. Yeah, if there is, curious. A little bit slow. Uh, oh, God. Are these people going to have a go at us? Some of these are just people having a go um, at me. <laughs> we, need, we need longer episodes and more uploads, please. May Allah reward your efforts. Uh, what other one do we have? We've got... Mm. Oh, here's one. Oh, I skipped quite a few. Uh, how do you overcome laziness? I have so many things that I want to achieve, and I know what steps to do. But some days I feel the motivation, and others I don't. Um, this goes back to what I sort of said earlier. Um, mm. I said about the tackling mindsets. Um, I've realised I've been on stop and start very often, in quite quick succession, and beating myself up about it because. I feel like, oh, I'm never going to get into a routine or, you know, have a long streak of doing good or feeling good or feeling like I'm achieving things. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, identifying initially what, what is doing that, what, sort of questioning whether it's even, is it even possible to to have such a long uh, streak of, of achievement, if you know what I mean? Like, People say someday he's saying, some days I feel the motivation mm. and others I don't. Is it possible to always feel motivated? I don't know. I, I'd, I'd argue, but maybe not. But that's always going to be a subjective thing. Like I know that I'm never always motivated. So, mm. what is it? Mm. My thing is that motivated or not, you will do what you mm. said you would do. You know, <laughs> tough luck. You. You know, be disciplined yeah. rather than motivated. I think that's what's important is identifying that. I think what I've started trying to do is identify things that I already do every day and then seeing, mm. uh, like dissecting that behavior and why, what is it that leads me to do that every day? And one of the things is getting up and going to work. Mm. Like I do that every day. So what is it mm. that gets me out of bed in the morning mm -hmm. for that? What what kind of what mm. is the behavior that leads to that, and how can I dissect that and take that and apply that to other things? Mm. You know, that's what I said in previous episodes. Is that the the closest you could get to guaranteeing you'll do something is mm. accountability. Yeah. You know, so that you have somebody waiting for you at work. If you don't go, they're yeah. calling you, aren't they? Yeah. So you're yeah. going, isn't it? Um, same, imagine you go to the masjid and people know you at the masjid and then you're not there. If you miss one, two, three salah, they're going to start asking, yeah. where is this guy? Yeah, it's good to have a peer group that can do that. And even if it's quite harsh, it's it's going to get you to where you need to go, isn't it? I think that's why people obviously yeah. get teachers. And one of the main you know successes is having a teacher that teaches yeah. you Quran or whatever. Is that There is that level of accountability because people yeah. can say, yeah, I will learn on my yeah. own. and never really pans out amazingly <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah yeah uh yeah i think like i said we've we've addressed some of that earlier mm. uh, so the question is how do you stay motivated no it? it's how do you overcome laziness 
Um, oh, I was going to share the the du'a of the Prophet uh, Yeah, which that's, I think many people know. Go for it, because that's one of the main. Uh, I've got it up here actually. If you want me to do it. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan wal-ajzi wal-kasal wal-bukhli wal-jubn. So al-kasal is there, which is laziness. Mm. Um, morning and evening so, are the card you know, the, part of that, aren't they? So in the morning and the evening. I think so, yeah. Yeah, there's uh, uh, the book, uh Yeah, so this one, for example, this is the mor- one of the morning ones. Asbahna wa asbahal mulku lillah wa alhamdulillah. La ilaha illallah wa ahduhu la sharika lah. Lahu mulku lahu alhamd. Wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Rabbi as'aluka khayra ma fi hadha al-yawm wa khayra ma ba'da. Wa a'udhu bika min sharri hadha al-yawm wa sharri ma ba'da. Rabbi a'udhu bika min al-kasli wa su' al-kibr. Rabbi a'udhu bika min a'adhaban fi al-nari wa a'adhaban fi al-qabr. So mm. morning and evening are quite very important for this sort of thing, mm. and also identifying the 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 key things that are happening that you're doing that are affecting your energy levels. Like I know for a fact yeah, that yeah. I, because my sh- my shifts are very all over the place, mm. I will work till maybe two or three in the morning on one day, and then I have my days off, and then I have to get up for work at five when I first mm. start again but I'm so used to staying up that I stay up the night before and then suddenly I only have five hours sleep or four hours sleep or whatever mm. um, that definitely affects my mood for the rest of the yeah, day yeah definitely um, now, I've, I've got the same thing because I, I don't think I've slept well for years to be honest mm. which is very bad um, but um, but yeah when I wake up you know let's say I slept late and I, I've tried I force myself to wake up um, at the same time regardless of when I went to sleep even though, of course, it's up to me when I wake up. Mm. Um, and sometimes just my head is mashed, but I just force myself. I try and force myself. But I think it's good. Like, So with you, for example, going to work, you're, go- you're going to work. No doubt there are days you don't want to go to work, right? But you go anyway. You're training yourself to be disciplined where it's like, I don't want to do it, but I will do it anyway. Mm. And I think, you know, having that structure or at least so at least you have that in one part of your life inshallah will allow you to extend that discipline to other parts of your life Mm. and of course the more you can have structure so imagine you had work uh, which is holding you accountable you had a quran teacher you had a personal trainer for the gym yeah let's say you had these three yeah now in so many parts of your life you're you're being held accountable i think it's inevitable that you would become more of a disciplined person because you're constantly forcing yourself to do things you don't feel like doing yeah but I don't think we could give a master class on how to be motivated in this format. But um, I, I basically, my short thing is don't be motivated. Who cares? Be be disciplined. So mm, For real. For real, for real. Discipline is key, bro. That's why they call them disciples. It's the same root word. Mm. I don't mm. know. I think so. <laughs> oh, subhanAllah. Um, right, Achi, how long have we been recording for today? Oh, an hour and a half. Gosh, my mm. nice listeners. Allah, Allah. You're getting treated today, and it's all my fault. <laughs> Let me quickly address these these final questions, actually, because okay. they're things I have to hold my hands up to. So we need longer episodes and more uploads, please. May Allah reward your efforts. So one of the key issues that we have in terms of longer episodes is that because of different time zones, our prayers are at different times. That's one thing, isn't it? So mm-hmm. like... You know, it might be it might be coming up to Dhuhr or whatever for you, and you need to go and pray whilst it is still isn't time for us. So it isn't Dhuhr yet for me, but what time is mm. it for you? It's is it is it Asr for you or? Yeah, it's Asr very soon. Okay, so there's that. Um, I've also like we're both we're both parents now, man, and it's not easy. Like I have to shut the door and lock my son away, who's desperate for my attention, and he'll be bang. And you, I'm sure you guys have heard him in the background of episodes banging and and need some help and wants my attention and blah 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 and you just feel guilty and I have to pick between my highest listeners and my son and I, it's not a very easy decision to make so I'll cut mm. the episode I'll be like okay I'm going <laughs> um, yeah. and in terms of timetables and stuff a lot of the time we don't record on a schedule is mainly because of me because although I mean can timetable himself well I struggle to um, but I have been better I think more recent you know the past six months than I have before um, mm-hmm. I have had a bit of a lapse li- lately, but I'm trying to get back on it again. Even today, like Saturday, and by stroke of luck, I wasn't at work. 
uh, even though I was meant to be. And then Amini messaged me, and I was like, "Oh yeah, about that. Let's record." <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, but Mind Heist does mean a lot to me, and I need to get on doing more and trying mm. to get on top of it. And this is one of the things we were talking about about you know setting good habits and being productive and achieving things. Mm. Um, you know, bro. You know the length of the episodes. I sometimes feel like one hour or maximum one hour and a half. That's good. Like, I feel like um, how do what's the thing? Uh, you know, like be mean, keep them keen. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> or like you know, like if you withhold a little, just a little bit, people want the next episode. Whereas yeah. imagine every episode was three hours, they might not be so interested to listen to the next one. Yeah, exactly. I think having a bit too much sort of. Um too much of us can can spoil the the meal yeah you know? i can't imagine what you know like those joe rogan listeners like doesn't he upload like three hours episode every day or something yeah, like that it's a bit much isn't it yeah i can't i mean i can see there's people that would have that sort of lifestyle that can accommodate that i remember when i used to have my old job i used to have you know eight hours to listen to podcasts mm. um mad yeah but i don't have that luxury anymore so I've, yeah. you know, I've, I, I, although I've subscribed to a lot of podcasts, I barely ever listen to any these days mm. because just not having any time yeah. alone to do so. Um, yeah, and I think we would hope that you're able to and you do listen to every single episode, you know. And inshallah, it's very manageable to listen to like one hour or an hour and a half a week. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, and I think we'll leave the the rest for another day, inshallah. Inshallah, glad to have covered those. Jazakum Allah khairan for all the um, comments or questions. Um, remember, we're not like experts. I mean, I'm sure we have certain skills or certain area in certain areas of our life. Maybe we feel we could contribute, but sometimes uh, just the fact that we have a podcast doesn't mean we're um, you know high performers in every part of our life, yeah. isn't it? Um, so just keep that in mind, Inshallah, and. Um, uh, thanks for listening to be honest thank you and uh, I would hope that uh, this this relationship of you listening to us is beneficial in all ways so meaning when we say something good you praise us and when we say something wrong you hold us to account and that way it will be beneficial for everyone and if you want to donate anything to the Mind Heist um, team I mean, <laughs> then please just make dua for us and that will be fine <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay i'm wondering where you're going with that <laughs> yeah so in order to uh, give us comments questions corrections go to mindhousepodcast.com in order to get our address to send all the gifts <laughs> then email us <laughs> um yeah thanks uh thanks bro and thanks everyone for listening Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Shadu an la ilaha la anta. Astaghfiruka wa tuwi ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.